Good morning, everyone. Um, just to say, obviously, it was funded by Historic England. Um, the logo is not correct, but <laughs> um, the key thing is obviously we did it in partnership with East Sussex County Council um, to look at issues of national importance and specifically for identifying and mapping sites of sort of national importance within a specific wetland area. Oh, sorry, it's the wrong way. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was wondering. Um, I won't run through all the aims, but basically it was to utilise existing evidence um, to basically better inform our understanding of significance, uh, characterise and the extent of sites of national importance and assess their particular vulnerability uh, mm -hmm. to um, future development and land use change. Um, and specifically we were exploring ways to identify, predict and manage sites of national importance. Um, like any good advice from a pilot study, they suggested to go for a small area, specific questions targeted uh, to, to sort of bring out, um, like most archaeologists, I ignored the, the good <laughs> advice and uh, went for East Sussex. Um, uh, and there's a good reason why I, I went for East Sussex is because um, wetland sequences, obviously people tend to go towards the Fens, Somerset Levels. Um, key wetland sequences which have been studied in the past in great detail, and various monitoring and management uh, already in place. Um, I've worked in East Sussex for the last 10 years, um, so my idea was to go for an area that was maybe more representative and certainly an area which was facing new challenges where sites and potential national importance were turning up in local environments um, and that type of area, those type of issues. Um, could hopefully be expanded and would be seen on other areas. Um, first of all, of course, we needed some sort of framework. Obviously, East Sussex is a very large area. Um, we needed to look at the current protection measures that are in place to look at what wetland sites were there, were they protected, what is the whole framework for national protection in East Sussex. Um, so the idea is we use the national character areas. Um, basically divided up in the High Weald, the Low Weald, South Downs, Pevensey Levels and a little bit of Romney Marsh. Um, and essentially what we looked at was we looked at the current distribution of scheduled monuments. We looked for biasness, historical biases, gaps, um, how they were distributed, what phases were represented and how many wetland sites were protected under scheduling. And as you can see, just from that sort of pie chart, the vast majority, not surprisingly, is in the South Downs. Um, but interestingly, areas like the High Weald actually had a very low percentage. Um, here's an example. This is just obviously the South Downs. A very high percentage of scheduled monuments were obviously prehistoric. The barrows, you can just see, obviously, along the ridges. Very visible archaeology, identifiable. Uh, through aerial photography and of course the great biasness between studies uh, focusing on areas like the South Downs um, and of course that's reflected in the scheduling. Uh, this is the high world, you can see the complete difference in the distribution, uh, prehistoric again, small little area here of rock shelters. Um, so again you can see um, we have a number of different areas again that are associated with uh, metalworking. Um, so raw materials in the high world, not surprisingly we have a number of um, ironworking sites and quarries um, and again the focus of research and attention has, has sort of been reflected in what's been scheduled. Um, interestingly between those two no sites of wetland sequences or, or wetland sites are actually protected in both those two areas. Um, and obviously when we're talking about scheduling there are other uh, protections certainly for wetland sequences which we had to consider um, and this is obviously the conservation and protection areas. Quite a lot of wetland sites or wetland sequences are covered by triple SIs, um, <coughs> RAM sites, um, special protection areas, areas of conservation 
Uh, and certainly in East Sussex, we have some significant ones. We've obviously got the Pevensey Levels, uh, the Coombe Haven, and uh, sorry, the uh, Haven, Coombe Haven, and parts of sort of um, Romney Marsh. Uh, and again, that sort of limits the impact that commercial development can do in these areas. Um, but it doesn't stop the issues to do with uh, flood alleviation, habitat recreation, which can all actually have just as, as a damaging and adverse effect as um, commercial development. Okay, here's uh, a close-up of Pevensey levels. The one site that is scheduled um, in East Sussex that is specifically um, uh, a wetland site, and that's obviously the site of Shonewater, the Bronze Age platform. Now that's been described as um, uh, the sort of southeast flag fen. Um, unfortunately, not many people have heard of Shrewsbury because, unlike Flag Fen, it hasn't received the sort of attention, uh, and certainly it was the importance of the area wasn't recognised, and a, a large part of that platform was unfortunately destroyed uh, while as part of a, um, a flood alleviation or a digging of a large lake, uh, and the, unfortunately some rescue digs had to then go in and do some targeted work. Um, Interestingly, it took to, it was up until only recently in 2012 has the site actually been scheduled. So, for it, order it to reach the um, to it, for it to qualify as an as a monument, um, it took a certain amount of time and additional research before they could get sufficient evidence to actually meet the criteria. Um, and for those who don't know about um, Shine Water, it was a large sort of platform, wooden platform in the middle of the um, Willingdon levels, although as part of the national areas, it's part of Pevensey levels. Um, a series of wooden sort of trackways, causeways going in between. And on the platform itself, it had a series of artifacts, including human skull, human material, various sort of domestic artifacts, an amazing sort of preservation. And I think as part of English heritage's, um, uh, sorry, Natural Eng uh, <laughs> 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 English heritage. <laughs> um, it's it was rated as triple A uh, in terms of it, the preservation and the potential. Um, interestingly, you see in the Pevensey levels, um, you do have scheduled monuments on some of the islands. Um, again, you know you've got Pevensey Castle here, the landing spot supposedly of William the Conqueror, North Eye deserted medieval <coughs> village, whole series which potentially have wetland sequences associated with them, but are not actually covered by some of the, by some of the scheduling because they're not specifically wetland sites. Here's an example of Pevensey Level. Um, the site is part of a Ramsar site, and so any sort of work in there does have to be tightly controlled. Unfortunately, heritage is not always considered when they're digging drainage ditches, where they're creating new habitat ponds, when they're doing a lot of work, and this was just a small project that mainly uh, that I was involved in, mainly um, because the East Sussex County Council um, were advising, and they suggested that the the proposal to uh, create new ditches and to dig out ditches had to assess the archaeological impact specifically, not so much obviously on the scheduled monument of the deserted Middle village, but on the wetland sequences at the edge, where there could be evidence of salt working, prehistoric activity. That could effectively be disturbed, um, and this was just a very sort of um, it was essentially a borehole survey just to look at that sequence and to assess that impact. The only difficulty is, is there's no legal framework then to do any follow-on work if there is, you know, the potential is identified. And obviously here we had quite significant potential peak deposits or pre potential prehistoric date um, that could be impacted by ditch clearance. Um, another site that's the Seven Sisters. Uh, it's the Coombe Haven um, as part of a um, new tidal regime sort of management plan coming in. So effectively, they were going to remove the sea defences and to reflood an area. They wanted, and again, uh, East Sussex came in and said, well, we need to assess the heritage of ice. Uh, we need to sort of give people a good understanding of what the impacts are going to be. Um, as part of this, again, as a really sort of targeted study, um, to see what that impact would be on the heritage. Um, what you see here is a uh, geophysical survey, slightly different to our conventional archaeological geophysical surveys in the sense that we're not looking specifically for archaeology. What we're doing is mapping sediments. We're trying to understand the landscape, 
the sedimentary uh, environments and the changing land history or the changing environmental history so that we can understand the potential of that sequence and where archaeology could be located. And again, as part of the geophys, we obviously then go in and do a sort of series of targeted boreholes just to see if our mapping is correct. This is just, a, I'm not going to run in the details, but just to say you've got a 30 meter deep estuarine sequence, um, very fluvially active sequence, um, and what that sort of baseline information can tell us is that when we compare this site to what we saw at Shinewater or on the Pevensey levels, we have a de very different type of sedimentary environment. We have a less sheltered, more estuarine, uh, fluvially active environment, and of course we have a completely different potential for archaeology, archaeological preservation and archaeological activity. And so some of these studies have helped us over time build up information about where we could find archaeology in these environments, where we'd expect archaeology, and you know when these sites are potentially affected by various schemes, is what type of mitigation or what type of things we, we should be looking for. Um, this is this is the Coombe Haven. Um, I unfortunately the lidar bit hasn't come out exactly well, but this is you can see the main Coombe Haven basin with a series of rivers, tributary valleys coming in. Um, a proposed, um, at that stage, uh, infrastructure development was proposed right across the mouths of the rivers, sort of skirting the edges of the Coon Haven. So those two previous projects you saw allowed us to sort of say, well, look, we've got these ideas about sedimentation, about where archaeology could be, what the potential is. This gave us some real potential to look at sort of interface zones, areas of potential, and look where we could see archaeology. Um, this is uh, what you see there is actually a geoarchaeological deposit model based on geotech and borehole information and that allowed us to basically create uh, an understanding of where we have interface zones, where we have islands, where we should target if we're going to look for early prehistoric and potentially nationally important sites. This is uh, a very similar plot to what you saw uh, on the previous sort of geophys. Again, similar to the GeoArc model, which is always good that the two data sets compare to each other. And again, what we're seeing here is areas where we can clearly see edge environments where we may have flint scatters, islands which would be perfect focus for activity. Um, and so the road scheme eventually got the go ahead. There was a few uh, doubts when uh, the, the government changed and uh, they cancelled the project for two years. Eventually we got to go in um, and basically we did a whole series of evaluations, um, geoarchological test pits, boreholes and excavations as part of that, that scheme. Um, one of the things that this road scheme gave us in particular was because we could look at potential of these interface zones, these edges, and look for areas of national importance. Um, and essentially what we did, and what, uh, the, the interesting thing is, look, we hit quite a lot of nationally important material, um, and the all the way along, the, uh, there was key sort of wetland sequences and areas where we thought had significant potential to have early prehistoric activity, preserve early prehistoric activity. Um, at the Coombe Haven, around the edges, we found potentially up to 400,000 bits of worked flint, 200 individual flint scatters, between 12 and 15 burnt mounds, barrows. Um, it's a, you know in terms of a dream site, it's it's, a, it's, it's pretty up there. Um, just to give you an idea, this is just one of the areas. This is area 15, little spur sticking out of uh, the wetland edge. Um, essentially, it was about 100,000 flints, um, mainly sort of covering the transitional period, late Mesolithic through to the early Neolithic, we had late Neolithic pottery, halves, uh, burnt mounds, and then throughout the wetland edges, we were turning up everything from upper Paleolithic sites, middle Mesolithic sites, late Mesolithic sites, and then later flint work. And then we obviously had a series of associated arrows uh, and burnt mounds and features associated with this landscape. Um, 
this is just a sort of sample of, uh, uh, of just some of the images of we just sort of came out of the field recently, mainly because we were in danger of drowning. But, um, <laughs> one of the challenges of doing any wetland sites is the fact the Coombe Haven is still a very active system in the sense that it goes underwater in winter. And um, unfortunately, the two don't work together very well of trying to do excavations. And you can just see in that photo there, the walls are just literally lapping at the edge of the, the site. Um, one of the other challenges is obviously is if huge amounts of flints, you need ways to process them. And you need a way to deal with the samples. And big sites require sort of big in, inputs of money and big inputs of resources. Um, this is the site you've just seen photo of. Um, this is just one of many sites along the wetland edge. There is effectively, you can see clear clusters, clear concentrations. Um, and I've also put an insert of a proposed habitat pond uh, just at the top. And you can see, you know, if a habitat pond or, a, or a ecological pond goes in, in these environments, the potential in these areas of a relatively small of how much flint, and it could be up to 50,000 flints just in that one pond. One of the interesting things is that when we were doing the evaluations, we identified, say, between six and seven main areas of flint scatters. Um, when we found, when we did the actual excavations, we found what was evaluated as a cluster of, say, three or four maybe even six flints, turned into 5,000. And the difference was, <coughs> because like a good archaeologist, when we were stripping to the evaluation trenches, we were stopping at the top of the natural, the bedrock. Um, these flints, certainly, and flints on other sites, they're vertically conflated. So they are five, five centimetres down to 50 centimetres down. They've moved down into the bedrock material, to the sands. Um, they still retain a certain amount of, uh, still retain their spatial integrity, but they're vertical, they move down the profile. And of course, for our traditional evaluation methods, we were finding more flint sometimes in the geopolitical test pits and in the boreholes than we were through the evaluation trenches. Um, along with that environment, I don't think you can see that very well, but essentially you have a, a barrow that we, we identified. Uh, and interestingly, we had very few barrows turn up. There are very, very, very few barrows identified in the high world. But pretty much you saw that concentration right from the South Downs uh, of all of those barrows on the top of the high ridges. In the high world, it seems we have a completely <coughs> different pattern. And we've recent work have just identified up to seven barrows in the high world, which doubles the number. And they're all associated with the Coon Haven in this area. And I don't think the Coombe Haven is particularly, you know, it, it's not unique in the sense is that I think in some areas like the Pevensey Levels and other areas around uh, Romney Marshes, the potential still exists. It's just no one's had to work there or target certain environments to look for this. Now, obviously, the key thing with these ones, individually, they can be protected, the barrows. Unfortunately, as part of the wider landscape, the part of the flint, the flint scattered all around the burnt mounds, the associated roadways, you know, you've essentially got a very nice early prehistoric landscape there that is a landscape and scheduling could only protect certain areas. Um, this is just to give you an idea and what I put in was just red. These are the ones that potentially could qualify under the criteria to be scheduled monuments if they haven't been sort of excavated or certainly of national importance. Um, the other scatters, the, the other 200 scatters, are obviously sites without structure. Um, you know, significant in their own means, but obviously wouldn't qualify for protection. So one of the key things is how do you protect that sort of landscape? How do you um, go about identifying these sites, managing them, and protecting them when sometimes, in some circumstances, they're not necessarily they're not necessarily disturbed by development pressures, they're actually to do with changes in land use or, for example, flood measures. Uh, and so what we were looking at is sites that potentially couldn't be scheduled but have the potential to be scheduled or, or would meet the uh, criteria for national importance um, but couldn't be actually protected. 
under that criteria. And one of the things, obviously, working with East Sussex County Council was to look at the alert mapping system that they use in planning, um, because obviously, there's the, one of the issues is the potential. Some of the most important sites and that potentially nationally important sites can only be established through excavation, through destructive excavation, or um, and of course. If those projects, if they're not going through the planning process, if they are part of permitted development, who monitors the work, who, who assesses where the potential is? Um, so one of the key things we we obviously discussed was updating the um, the alert mapping. And as you can again, you can see the current alert mapping at the bottom, and the slightly updated. And what we've done is use the <coughs> colour scheme just to show red as as nationally important. Yellow as more traditional sort of regionally important sites, and there's a third one which is green, which is the the sort of mapping uh, potential where certain things should be considered. Um, it's not saying that you know that there is nationally important sites there. It's saying that there has to be consultation with the county archaeologist for advice. Um, one of the key issues which we were discussing on the uh, things we were considering is obviously if you give any developer or any person a colour scheme, they tend to go for the red and ignore the green. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things we were saying is that it was potentially that that may only be used by curators to help their understanding and it, the rest would just be seen as a greyed sort of horizon. Um, one of the key things with this is so that we would, there would be, we, and I think Dick sort of approached it, that there has to be some sort of integration with shine mapping so that some of the biggest threats flood, uh, flood alleviation um, you know which could involve sort of putting trees or well, suggestion putting trees all around the wetland interface so um, you can imagine what that would do to an area like the Coombe Haven um, digging large balancing ponds and you can see the impact that could have on a, on a early prehistoric site um, and ditch clearance um, and so what you know they're what they're one of the things we, we came out is there's got to be more heritage input and consultation into wetland management um, overall, working with partners in the government, of Natural England, the Environment Agency, uh, people who are responsible for sort of the wetland sequences because quite a lot of these areas are not under threat from commercial development, they are from changing land use and um, various environmental and flood alleviation schemes. Um, this is just obviously one of the things, uh, various sort of conclusions. Um, one of it was specifically identify within the HER sites of national importance as a sort of a thing and have those clearly labelled and justified so that that also can update the alert mapping so that you can actually sort of filter that out and you've got a way to say, all right, it's not scheduled, but it's clearly of national importance. Um, obviously, the uh, the key thing, obviously, heritage resources need to be taken more into account during the development of wetland management plans. It's not worth preserving a site in situ if you're going to do, dig a huge, massive pond next to uh, a potentially wetland site. Um, and we've seen that from sites like Shinewater. Um, greater use and development of alert mapping to cover key wetland sequences and environments. Um, that's a slightly biased one of multidisciplinary geoarch investigations to help alert mapping, but certainly information, fact-finding sort of data that helps us understand the landscapes and understand where the archaeology could be preserved in certain environments so that we can better make decisions based on that sort of information. Um, and where these sites are threatened, whether through development or through land use change, um, to use evaluation techniques as part of the planning process to sort of um, determined if a site is threatened, whether it's worth, worthy of further protection or preservation in situ. Um, and obviously the key thing is that scheduling of sites still needs, has a very important role to play because the alert mapping, um, the sort of work through the planning process, still doesn't offer any legal protection. It's only scheduling. Um, uh, the, the alert mapping only sort of provides a, a discussion point where we can we can sort of raise those issues.
Quick. Need to be brief, I'll be please. very yes. I'll be very I'll be very very quick. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, five points. Um, my name is Casper Johnson. I'm county archaeologist at East Sussex. So I've been working with Carl in Oxford on this project, and there are sort of five key things I want to pick up on. Uh, the first is, uh, and today really represents this, is the importance of the sector working together to look at heritage assets across the board, regardless of whether they're, they're designated or not because all non-archaeologists make a starting point of looking at what's designated. That's their starting point. You, and you're all familiar with this. You get a big scheme, the consultants who may be general environment, environmentalists, they look at the designated assets first. And the undesignated assets tend to get picked up well down the process when it can be very late to do too much about it. So I think a cross-sector approach with English Heritage, CIFA, the academics, uh, the contractors that are here, and the local planning archaeologists, that's going to be incredibly important going forward. So this project's very good for that, I think. Um, the second point was about policy and local plans. Uh, I spent quite a bit of my time trying to work with local planners, heads of planning uh, in East Sussex and Brighton Hove and South Downs National Park about what heritage assets are and why the undesignated ones, the ones that haven't been put on the big maps, the scheduled sites, the listed buildings, why they may also be important. And we've been trying to do that for a number of years, and Carl's picked up on that with the alert mapping. Um, so that's really important, getting the, the value of undesignated heritage assets into local plans through the description, and that can be well backed up by the sort of literature that Historic England and others are producing. The third point is about HERs. We've got to have consistency in terms of ter terminology. One of the things that's really interesting was Carl coming to Sophie, my HER officer. There's only three of us in East Sussex. Myself, Sophie, who's here in the audience with us, my colleague Greg, who's in the farming one, as Deborah pointed out, we're trying to cover our bases today. Uh, lots of interesting stuff going on. Um, Carl came to Sophie and said, okay, we're going to do this project with Casper and you guys. Um, what have we got? If we put the word lithics in, what do we find? And we obviously found we've got a lot of inconsistency in all the records that have been built up for many, many years. Um, it's very difficult to search and compare. Designation, I'm old enough to go back to the MPP days. I was around in the 1980s with uh, Tim Darvill and Bill Starton and others doing MPP descriptions a long time ago. Um, and it was a lot of it's about comparisons, about context. National importance is very much about context. The only way you can get context is if you've got good data. So you have to have standardized data. So that's a key area and it's going to need a lot of resources for help from Historic England and others. It's going to be really important for local planning authorities going forward. Um, the fourth point um, was about alert mapping. Alert mapping is absolutely crucial. It's not, a, it's not a designation. It's a trigger mechanism, but it does have a powerful role to play in planning. And most of our planners will come to us if things are going on in uh, our, what we call archaeological notification areas or whether they are of a certain scale that requires some work. So alert mapping is crucial. We did some work a few years ago on a place called Ashdown Forest where we looked at this red, amber, green, this RAG system. But we simply, because we had had English heritage, or as it was in those days, funding for some LIDAR, we immediately identified some pillow mounds, for example. All the known pillow mounds uh, were scheduled. We then discovered another 40 or 50 or whatever it was. So we said, well, let's put a red polygon over those because they're, you know, the ones we knew about were scheduled. Let's call these national importance. So we started a sort of red, amber, green alert mapping, but it's in-house. It's not for planners. We've been to planners and said, do you want red, amber, green to try and say, well, we'll consult you on this, or, and they said, no, it's too complicated, we simply can't do it. Just give us one alert map, we'll come to you, you look at it in-house. So that's the way we're going at the moment on that, and this project has very much backed that up. Final and fifth point, so that Tim can get in, um, and he's going to follow on. No, take your time, Casper. <laughs> <laughs> I want Tim to get in on the planning side on this, because it's really crucial. Um, is standards for archaeological work and particularly about assessing and evaluating lithic sites in wetlands. And this is the big thing, the big point that Carl's been working on, the big conclusions of this project, is how do you get enough data to demonstrate that something is nationally important? The Link Road's a classic example. Now that the field work's pretty much completed, it's a very easy question to say, how could this road have been built if it's basically required the excavation of so many important things scattered sites? And of course, as all of us here as archaeologists know, it's actually very difficult when things are deeply buried in wetland environments to do enough work to demonstrate how extensive. So the, the first speaker's comments about the extent of sites, the mass of sites, is terribly important. 
And uh, for us in East Sussex, the work that Oxford had done, and also Archaeology Southeast, and some of the guys from Archaeology Southeast here are here with some sites, similar sites that they've been working on in East Sussex, are going to be terribly important because they provide the data against which pre more predictive modelling can be done. And that's crucial as well. And I, I think one has to recognise the value of ex well excavated material to allow you to provide that context and understand national importance. You, you need that data. And we're coming from quite a long way back in East Sussex. We haven't had the big data sets of the infrastructure schemes to provide the evidence. We're catching up now because of housing and infrastructure schemes. And so hopefully this sort of cross-sectorial work uh, on national importance is going to, be, going to be really, really helpful. But it will require everybody working together. So those are my key points. Casper, thank, thank you so much. That was <laughs>